What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of news to go over here this week, all kinds of exciting stuff. And I already covered the 2022 Honda Civic and the 2022 Subaru BRZ that both were revealed earlier this week. And they're really big deals that I know many of you were excited about. So I wanted to cover those right away. So I will link those videos above if you haven't watched those yet. Um, but there's lots of other exciting news to go over here this week. I mean, coming up, we have Jeep put a V8 in the Wrangler, Infiniti made their first coupe SUV, and there's some very impressive new Mybox and Lamborghinis. And so uh, we'll cover all that and more. So first up, the Wrangler here. Uh, Jeep revealed the 2021 Wrangler Rubicon 392. And so this is doing what Ford wouldn't do with the Bronco, give it a V8. So anyone familiar with the Mopars knows that the 392 is the 6.4 liter Hemi V8 engine. And in this application, it does 470 horsepower and 470 pound-feet of torque, along with a four and a half seconds zero to 60 time for a Wrangler. 13 second quarter mile time too. So yeah, the it kind of to me feels like the cheaper version of the insanity you get with an AMG G-Wagon with those things having tons of power and just being hilarious uh, because it's this giant box that's going way faster than it should. Um, anyway, so getting back to the Wrangler here, it comes with an eight-speed automatic as standard. It's only available in the four-door unlimited body style. Of course, it also has four-wheel drive as standard. So those are the only restrictions. You can't get a manual. You can't get it in a two-door. Otherwise, though, it seems like, you know, there's lots of stuff you can get on them. It gets a dual-mode exhaust. So you can make it nice and loud if you want. And it's even slightly more capable, they claim, than a regular Rubicon because the 392 version here gets an additional two-inch lift. And so the lift doesn't actually increase ground clearance for some reason. Um, it's actually half an inch less ground clearance than a V6 Rubicon. But the approach and departure angles are slightly better. There's also unique Fox shocks and it also has all kinds of other upgrades here like a secondary intake to keep providing air even if the functional hood scoop's blocked or if the Jeep is fording water, it can uh, divert that water away. Um, it also gets beefed up frame rails, control arms, steering knuckles and axles. You can also um, even get those lower cut doors that were on the concept version of the 392 Jeep. And so it's pretty awesome that those are available here and um, they're actually gonna be available with all the roof setups as well. So if you want the low doors, but you still want a hard top and stuff, you'll be able to get all those different combinations. So that's cool. Other touches on the outside here, it gets a hood from the Gladiator Mojave. Uh, of course, it has the 392 badges on it though to make it unique. You also get unique wheels and some bronze colored touches both on the outside there on like the tow hooks and stuff. And on the inside, uh, it's also gonna be the first Wrangler to get paddle shifters uh, because it's you know a little bit sportier here. And that sounds really hilarious seriously fun. I'm looking forward to hopefully driving one here next year. There is no pricing yet for them, but they are saying it is going to be available in the first quarter of 2021. So should come here before the spring or right around there. And uh, so yeah, awesome that Jeep just went for it and did that. I think that is super cool. Infinity this week has also revealed the 2022 QX55. So this is uh, based on the QX50, but does get uh, more tweaks than just the coupe back end to give it that, you know, fast back look. Up front it has a larger grille and a more aggressive front bumper to match the sportier back end but in the back um, it gets more aggressive rear doors there and quarter panels that uh, kind of sweep up uh, into those cool looking taillights that I really like. You also get a new rear hatch and a bumper area. One of the big things is the bumper now holds the uh, license plate. Previously it was a little bit higher up there. I think overall the whole look in the back is kind of reminiscent of a BMW X4 but I think it actually looks better than an X4 in my opinion. All QX55 also get 20 inch wheels to round out that sportier look and mechanically it's going to be the same as the QX50 meaning it gets um, the 2 liter variable compression turbo engine that does 268 horsepower and 280 pound feet of torque sadly it's still connected to a CVT so um, yeah that's going to kind of kill a little bit of the sportiness all wheel drive is standard though and the interior is the same as a QX50 uh, as well aside from uh, most likely having less rear headroom and less cargo space since that's typically the way it goes for a lot of these uh, coupe SUVs so um, but I didn't see any official measurements for that kind of stuff 
But anyway, those are going to be on sale in the spring of 2021 as well, but there's no pricing yet for those either. Mercedes this week has revealed the new Maybach S580. And so it's very uh, grand looking, I guess. It just, uh, you know, it's pretty awesome, especially with those two-tone paint jobs, which they say can take up to two weeks to paint. And so it gets a similar grill to the Maybach GLS, lots of chrome and bright work all over. Um, the hood is unique with this uh, ridge it has in the middle here. There's also illuminated badges on the side of the car there on the rear quarter panel area, which I believe is the first time since the 70s that something like that's been done. You know, like the Lincolns and Cadillacs, I think, back then kind of had those opera lights on the, uh, you know, on the fake uh, soft tops that they had on those huge land yachts back in the 70s. I don't think there's been any kind of side lighting since then. I could be wrong, but... Uh, Pretty, I think it's pretty swanky here in this application. The whole car, by the way, is seven inches longer than a regular S-Class um, with all that extra length added to the back seat area, of course. Speaking of that interior, it's absolutely loaded with luxury, starting with plush leather everywhere, even on the ceiling. There's wood on the front seat backs, along with 11.6 inch screens on both sides. There's also a removable touchscreen in the middle for controlling various things within the car. It packs a 30 speaker, 1,750 watt Burmester sound system, surround sound, um, that will flood the silent cabin with sound if you want. But if you want to just listen to silence, um, you can have that too with extra sound deadening that they have in the Maybach here. There's also thicker laminated glass active noise cancellation and so all that will help to keep out noises out of the cabin if you you know don't want to have them and so that's uh, pretty nice that they're adding all that uh, you can even get foam filled tires to cut down on road noise i think a little bit which is pretty impressive if you get the executive seating package you also get uh, the two reclining uh, seats there that massage not only the seat but also massage the leg rests which I think is a first for any car to have massaging leg rests. Um, and I think it's a first for any furniture. I don't know of, aside from an actual massage chair, um, I don't know of an actual chair that does that. That's pretty wild and uh, pretty cool. So uh, it also gives you seatbelt airbags and the new front airbags for rear seat passengers that Mercedes first introduced on the regular S-Class. So right beneath those screens there, there will be airbags that deploy to help protect the rear seat occupancy even better, which is pretty wild that it has that too. Lastly, you can get a refrigerator with champagne flutes, of course, and even electrically assisted rear doors. All very, very swanky and impressive. Mechanically, it's the same as any other S580 with a twin turbo V8 that does 496 horsepower and 516 pound-feet of torque. It does have a unique drive mode, though, that dulls throttle response, does earlier shifts, and even starts in second gear to give you the least amount of shifts and the least amount of abruptness as possible. Possible. So um, that's kind of cool. It also makes many S-Class options standard, like the four-wheel steering and the air suspension. Um, and so we have no pricing yet for those. Uh, but of course, that's one of those ones, if you need to know the pricing, you probably can't afford it anyway. Um, that's going to be very expensive, especially with some of those options like the two-tone paint. Um, it's going to be available by the middle of 2021. So cool to see that. Lamborghini this week has revealed the Huracan STO. So it's inspired by the racing Huracans, but this one is street legal. And so it does 10 more horsepower out of the 5.2 liter V10 for a grand total of 640. But in exchange, you lose some torque over the Performante with the STO only having 417 pound-feet of torque, which is 26 less than the Performante. Um, zero to 60 is three seconds flat though, and top speed is 192.6 miles per hour. Um, so I guess they didn't want to round it up or down. They just had to do the exact number. Um, the seven speed dual clutch transmission has been amped up for quicker shifts, uh, but the main focus was on fast lap times. That's what this thing's about. So handling is where the big improvements are to be found. So first it's 95 pounds lighter than the Performante for a dry weight of 2,952 pounds. And that's thanks mostly to the fact that this is rear wheel drive. It ditches the all wheel drive system of the Performante, uh, but also 75% of the body panels are made out of carbon fiber now. So that helps with the reducing your weight. There is also magnesium wheels and 20% lighter windshield. Um, both help to you know, lower that weight as well. There's air ducts in the hood, a new front splitter, front brake ducts, and a manually adjustable rear wing that can probably be seen from space. Um, and so all that helps to give you really good downforce. And you can see there's a NACA air intake above the engine bay, along with another cooling air scoop and a shark fin to direct air onto that wing. And so all 
all those enhancements all combined add up to provide 53% more downforce to be exact than what it is done on the Performante. So a huge jump. They said aerodynamic efficiency is also up, so it'll cut through the air easier, even with that massive wing. And so suspension wise, it has a wider track, stiffer bushings and anti-roll bars and MagnaRide 2.0 dampers. And so all that, you know, helps to give it even better handling. They also are using the rubble steering in the STO. The interior is all carbon fiber, even the door panels and the floors, which by the way, the floors don't have any carpeting anymore. It's just bare carbon fiber because carpets are just too heavy apparently. Uh, the rest of the interior is covered in their version of Alcantara that they call Carbon Skin. And it's going to be on sale in the spring of 2021. And it's going to be starting at $328,000. But thankfully, I didn't see any mention of production limits. I'm sure it will be limited by something, but hopefully they're not, you know, going to make it ultra rare and they'll build, you know, as many as are ordered. That'd be kind of nice. We'll have to wait and see, but it's, it sounds like it's going to be pretty awesome and uh, looks very, very cool as well. So awesome to see that. In some much less exciting news, Land Rover has continued to roll out their 2021 updates uh, for all their vehicles. So a few weeks back, it was a bunch of Jaguar products. Now we have, uh, you know, last week we were talking about the Discovery. This week we have updates for the Velar, Evoque, and Discovery Sport. Thankfully, they're pretty brief, so nothing I have to dwell on too long. The Velar gets the biggest change, and that is that it's losing its supercharged V6, just like all the other Land Rover products, and uh, is now switching to the inline six turbo engine um, with 48 volt technology and so it has two different tunes like in others it does 335 horsepower and 354 pound feet of torque in the lower models and then in the p400 top trim it does 395 horsepower and 405 pound feet of torque and in this top trim, it'll do a 5.2 seconds zero to 60, so pretty quick. And the big improvement though is on the inside where it gets the new 10 inch touchscreen, uh, which does look very nice, but it's not as tall and massive as the really big uh, 10 inch touchscreen, or I think it's an 11 inch touchscreen you get in the Jaguar products. That was a lot more impressive. This is a little smaller, but still very high resolution and slick looking. And then moving on to the Evoque, that also gets this same new 10 inch screen. Um, and so that's its main update for 2021. But the other big change for the Evoque for 2021 is that sadly it's losing its higher horsepower engine. Um, so there was a 296 horsepower version of the four cylinder that's gone uh, for 2021. So now all Evokes get the slower 246 horsepower version no matter what. Uh, I'm sure most Evoke buyers probably won't care. This change also applies to the Discovery Sport, which also loses that more powerful engine and you know uses that same base motor instead. The Discovery Sport also does uh, get that same new screen and then also does finally have standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, because apparently I guess it didn't before. So now it finally has that. So anyway, there's no release date given for any of these, but I'm guessing they'll be available here relatively soon, unless COVID forces plants to shut down again. Otherwise, you know, I'm sure this will show up sometime early next year. And uh, an interesting story uh, from an interesting source. So there's a LinkedIn post this week done by Volkswagen CEO, and that's how they chose to confirm um, that Volkswagen will be making an electric ID wagon that's been approved for production. So it's likely a production version of the ID Space Vision that they uh, revealed last year. And so it should do similar range to what the concept was EPA rated at, which is about 300 miles of actual range here and uh, it could make sense to actually sell this in the states too since uh, it would give more range than the id4 most likely which i think maxes out around 250 miles of range and that's mostly just because this wagon would be more aerodynamic than a big blocky suv would be maybe there'd be some americans that would give up the high seating position still have tons of cargo space in exchange for an extra 50 miles of range i think there's some people that might do that trade-off so you know i think it would have a fighting chance here in the states better than most wagons have in the states so uh we'll have to wait and see what they do but it's gonna be a, a long wait because production won't be starting until 2023 they're saying so we still got you know about two years at least for that but um hopefully it'll look pretty close to the concept because the concept looked pretty sweet in my opinion and some other volkswagen news though we have more info about this rumored flagship luxury electric vehicle that uh, was called like project artemis or something was the rumored name um so now we have two different sources confirming this uh new information so first Actually, officially, the Commercial Vehicles Division of Volkswagen officially announced that their factory in Hanover, Germany, will be become the production site for three completely new premium electric vehicles in the group. These D SUVs are genuine flagship products, premium, 100% electric, and highly automated. 
And then according to a report in German newspaper Handelsblatt, um, the reason why they're being built in a commercial vehicle factory is because the SUVs are so huge that they can't build them in any of Volkswagen Group's other production facilities. So I don't know what you know how tight it is in the other factories, but if these vehicles are so huge, you can't build them in a massive factory. Like that sounds pretty crazy. I guess it just would be too much retooling to I guess adjust for the larger size. I don't know, but that's pretty crazy. And so um, the newspaper adds on to this, and uh, they're saying this is what their anonymous source is claiming. By the way, so that part isn't official as far as the size, but it lines up if. They're going to a commercial site. Why would you go to a commercial factory that makes enormous vans and have them build your premium flagship thing unless it was the only place that was big enough, I guess? Uh, crazy stuff. And other uh, stuff in the report here. Uh, supposedly the project is codenamed Landjet, and um, it's going to be a super luxurious electric vehicle and an SUV. And while Audi is supposedly leading development for this vehicle, Bentley and Porsche will be getting versions of it too. And so I'm not sure how I feel about a massive Porsche that's so large it doesn't fit in a normal factory. <laughs> I feel like that really is getting far away from Porsche's sporting character. Even if the thing does a two second zero to 60, like it's still, it's gonna be so huge and bloated. I mean, you know, the Porsche Cayenne's big enough as it is, making something way bigger than that. It's just, I don't know about Porsche. For Bentley, it's like a dream come true. It's like, you know, they can make it a rolling, luxury lounge um, and could be you know really really impressive and so you know i think for bentley it makes a ton of sense for audi it makes sense not sure about porsche but uh they're obviously going to plan on doing all three and they should all be going into production sometime around 2024 to 2025 supposedly so we'll have to wait and see on all that but uh very interesting to hear that in some other electric news uh gm ceo this week announced that gm is speeding up an all-out pursuit of global ev leadership by committing to 35% more spending by 2023 for a total of $27 billion to speed up the launch of over a dozen electric models, most likely the ones we know about already, like the Cadillac Lyric, the Hummer EV, stuff like that. Um, so I guess they're gonna try and spend more money to rush those to market faster. Uh, doesn't sound like a great recipe for success, but uh, you know we'll have to see. Um, but they did say eventually they want to offer EVs across the lineup um, from below thirty thousand dollars to over one hundred thousand dollars, and they want to be the number one in EVs in North America. Um, which uh, I'll get to that in a second. But GM is now claiming that their Ultium battery packs can do up to four hundred and fifty miles of range now, which is more than the 400 miles max that they were quoting before. Uh, not sure how they got that improvement, but that's what they're claiming now. They're also claiming a second generation of the batteries uh, will be available in the mid-2020s that will actually bring down the cost of those batteries to be close to uh, almost closing the price gap between that setup and a normal gasoline engine setup so that you wouldn't have a price premium really uh, for the electric version. And so that could be pretty significant if they can actually get that done because then you kind of remove the cost barrier, which would be helpful for sure. And so it all sounds great, but to be the number one in EVs, they're gonna have, if they're gonna you know, spend all these billions of dollars, they should spend it on infrastructure. Because that's what keeps people coming back to Tesla, I think, is that they have this huge supercharger network already. And uh, from the people that I've talked to that have owned other electric vehicles that are non-Teslas or people that have tested other non-electric, uh, your non-Tesla electric vehicles, it's just infrastructure. Like half the chargers aren't working and the chargers are still rare and hard to come by. And yes, we're only in the end of 2020 here and there are going to be improvements to infrastructure here in the next year or two with uh, the Electrify America network and stuff. But a lot of those chargers are down a lot of the time and there's all kinds of just issues with infrastructure. So I think if GM wants to spend billions of dollars, they need to put up chargers everywhere. Blanket every single you know road that's traveled pretty frequently, you know, put a charger on it somewhere so people can road trip in these things and, you know, be make them be fast chargers so you can get a charge reasonably quick and stuff. That is the thing they need is infrastructure. You can have huge range and stuff, but you still got to stop at some point and it's still um, you know, be something you're going to need to stop in a convenient place and uh, have your charger work every single time, just like how a gas pump works every single time, basically. So 
that's, I think, going to be the key to really get these to be widespread adopted, especially if they want to overtake Tesla. But they're going to have a lot of catching up to do here, um, even if their vehicles are top notch. So we'll have to wait and see on all that. Um, and moving on, a couple other electric stories here. So the big news this week was that both Britain and Quebec this week announced that they're going to have new gas vehicle deadlines here. So the UK is now planning to ban the sale of new gas and diesel cars and vans by 2030. So they moved it up from 2035 to 2030. 30 now um, so we're literally about nine years away from them not being allowed to sell any kind of new gas or diesel vehicle in the UK which uh, you know is a lot more aggressive than a lot of a lot of other countries um, so that's pretty crazy but uh, they're even going one step further and saying even new hybrids won't be able to be sold by 2035 so it's not just going to be enough to have something hybridized like it's gonna to have to be completely electric by 2035 um, but at least, you know, the gas stuff is going to be phased out in 2030. So, I mean, the hybrid thing, you can kind of, uh, you know, stretch it so you can make everything be hybrids and still kind of have a very similar gas component. So really, I still think the main deadline is 2035. And that seems to be what everyone else is agreeing on. California is saying that in Quebec also this week, that was their announcement, was they're targeting 2035 to get rid of gas powered passenger vehicles. It's a very ambitious target. I hope that, like I said, infrastructure is the main thing they need to improve if they want to truly meet those, those targets and get people to want those types of vehicles. And the last news story this week, not electric news, uh, Bloomberg News is reporting that they have an anonymous source that's claiming that Nissan is looking to get rid of their partnership with Mitsubishi Motors, or at least sell off some of the 34% of Mitsubishi Motors that they that they own. Um, and so that's a pretty big uh, statement. We'll have to see. I mean, again, this is just a report. This is just rumors, so um, nothing confirmed. But um, considering how desperate Nissan is to you know get back to being profitable, I mean, what does Mitsubishi do for Nissan? At least here in the States, I mean, there's not much that they help them out with. Uh, and honestly, all the rumors and stuff in the past have been suggesting that Nissan's going to give Mitsubishi stuff uh, to help Mitsubishi's lineup out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's kind of hard for them to help Mitsubishi if Mitsubishi's not helping them back and Nissan's struggling on its own. So, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it would be bad news for Mitsubishi. Especially here in the States, I think, you know, I don't know how it would play out for them, but I don't think it would be good news. But, um, you know, regardless, I, you know, I think it makes sense for Nissan. We'll see what ends up happening, though, if this ends up being a rumor, if they can actually get rid of the 34%, uh, especially with everyone else trying to, you know, budget cut this year and stuff. So we'll have to see how that uh, transpires. But um, anyway, interesting to hear that. But yes, that's it for all the news this week, guys. So thank you guys all very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts and everything in the comments below. Please continue to keep watching the, the updates. Subscribe and you know, make sure to tune in every Friday for all the updates. But yeah, thank you guys once again for watching. I'll see you guys on the next one. Continue to stay safe and healthy as well. Take care.